arrested during a trip to Sudan, missionary Peter Yashik was imprisoned with members of ISIS. One of the, the, the ISIS members was a Libyan guy who, at the age of 12, was a personal guard of Osama bin Laden in Tora Bora. And later on, when he returned to Libya, he was one of the uh, murderers who slaughtered the 20 Egyptians uh, on the uh, Egyptian, uh, Libyan uh, shore. He told me that if I was an American or a Russian, that he would uh, bro uh, break my neck uh, immediately and kill me. He took out a fishing string, uh, quite a strong fishing string from his pocket, and he was showing how he can kill a person within a few seconds with this fishing string. Peter discovered his other cellmates were just as extreme. When asked to share news from the outside, he told them about the Paris terrorist attack. When I said that 129 people got killed, uh, they interrupted me and they started to shout Allahu Akbar for several minutes. So immediately I, I knew that uh, the company that I was in and I stopped uh, telling them any more news. They called me a filthy pig or, or a filthy rat uh, and if I did not react to this new name, they started to beat me with, uh, with slapping my face or uh, fist to my face or then they used the wooden stick. So I uh, gradually, I learned to live with the new, new name. I was not Peter anymore, I was just filthy pig. How did it come to this? Why was this man dedicated to helping persecuted Christians now himself persecuted? Peter's arrest came in December 2015, just two years after the Sudanese government thought it had expelled all foreign Christian workers from the country. While visiting Sudan, Peter met with Christian leaders and recorded some video. Agents confiscated his equipment and charged him with spying against the government. During his first four months in jail, Peter asked God to return him to his family. His epiphany came after he led some Eritrean prisoners to Christ. And I suddenly started to realize that there is a purpose, that the Lord has a purpose for me to be in prison, to share the gospel with those people. And I started to be even more courageous uh, to open uh, my mouth and share the gospel also with the Muslims who were in, in, the, in the previous cell with me. In January 2017, a Sudanese court sentenced Peter to 20 years in prison. His work helping persecuted Christians in Sudan was considered an anti-state activity, espionage. I really uh, was considered to be a very dangerous person and they mentioned like that I am an employee of the uh, a spy organization called VOM. So actually VOM it was a spy, yeah, it's a spy organization. Not a missionary. No, not it's a, a mission spy. organization. Yeah, yeah. The son of a pastor, Peter had experienced persecution before growing up in communist Czechoslovakia. A wire service bulletin flashes the word to an unbelieving world. Christian oppression intensified in Czechoslovakia after Red Army tanks rolled through Prague in August 1968. Government agents constantly monitored Peter's parents and their Christian activities. They knew that we were receiving Bibles and uh, we were receiving Christian literature and we were also distributing, my parents were distributing that. One day, Peter returned home from school and found his parents missing. They were arrested by secret police and interrogated. And apparently the government, the secret police wanted to know what uh, was going on uh, in our house. And 36 years later, like his parents, Peter was arrested for his Christian activities. Only this time at the hands of Islamists, not communists. But God prepared Peter for his prison experience years earlier, when his father gave him a special gift. Without saying, much he brought the book written by Richard Wurmbrandt. Uh, uh, the name of the book in German was In Gottes Untergrund, which means in God's underground in English. And I was fluent in German at that time already. So he gave me this book and he said, read this book. It will encourage your faith. Peter's father passed at the age of 89 while Peter was in prison. And what do you think, Peter, he would, he would say to you about your time in prison? and what you went through if he were still around now. And he knew about it. All the details. Yeah. I'm, I'm quite sure that he would be proud of me. I'm quite sure, yeah. Peter was freed after spending 14 months in prison. 
He credits the Czech government for negotiating his release and the prayers and support of Christians around the world. Nearly half a million people signed a petition for him and thousands sent encouraging cards and letters. Peter says he was brought to tears when he heard some Sudanese women near the prison singing Christian praise songs. How did your experience change you? How is Peter Yashik different now compared to before your prison experience? When you come through this situation, you realize uh, that everything that you have is a grace of God and it is uh, on his strength that it is in prison. It is not your own strength that you can survive being humble and being faithful till the last moment. This is uh, the moment when we can be more than conquerors when we go through difficult situation because of our faith in Jesus Christ. A humble servant of the persecuted church, persecuted himself and then freed from prison. Grateful for those who prayed and for learning to wait patiently on God for victory and grace. Gary Lane, CBN News, Prague. Good morning, my dear brothers and sisters. It's a great uh, joy and honor uh, to be with you this morning and to worship the Lord and to expect what the Lord will do uh, through the Holy Spirit uh, with us in our lives. And I'm sure that the Lord will bless us and I hope that you will be encouraged uh, through my testimony. Um, it's a great, also a great honor for me to personally thank you for your prayers. I know that people were praying uh, around the world for me uh, and for my Sudanese fellow prisoners, brothers. Uh, and uh, we really felt the prayers. I will share later how important it was for us to know that many people were actually praying for us. Uh, you know, as you heard, uh, I come from the uh, Czech Republic. For some of you probably are more familiar with Czechoslovakia, uh, which uh, used to exist until 1992. You know, and this year uh, we will be celebrating 30 years of our freedom. Uh, freedom from communist power. Uh, you know, we read in Daniel 2.21 that the Lord is the one who is setting up kings and who is also removing them. And so, having been freed from the, com uh, freed from the communist dictatorship, um, we immediately started to, uh, you know, find out about other brothers and sisters who are still being persecuted. Uh, in fact, the number of countries uh, is increasing. Many people thought that when uh, the Eastern Bloc, uh, uh, you know, the communist power fell down in the Eastern Bloc, that uh, persecution uh, disappeared. In fact, persecution is increasing. And we, when we look into the Bible, we can see that the Lord Jesus was already preparing his followers and his disciples that they will be persecuted. You know, if you open Luke 21, from the verse 12, you will read that uh, the disciples uh, were told that they will be brought before religious and secular authorities because of Christ's name, and they will be put in prison. Then a few verses later, uh, the Lord Jesus continues, and he says that uh, you will be delivered up by uh, uh, family members, parents, friends. And then even he says, some of you will be killed. And if we look into John 15, uh, from verse 18 through 21, we can understand the very good theological foundation for the persecution. The Lord says and gives us the reason why we as Christians should always expect to be persecuted. Uh, he says uh, the reason why uh, the world hates us is because we are not of this world. The Lord says if you were from this world, the world would love you. Then the Lord says, the, Lord, uh, the, the world hated me before you because they don't know the one who sent me. So whenever we see persecution, we can be absolutely sure that those people do not know, do not know God. And uh, you know, when you look even to the book of Acts uh, and you hear about the first uh, persecution cases, <clears throat> you will realize that uh, the disciples, uh, when they were leaving uh, 
the Jewish authorities after being beaten, and that's the first uh, physical persecution that we have recorded in the book of Acts, in 5, Acts 541, they were rejoicing. Rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer for the name of Christ. And Paul, who was once uh, the persecutor, but the Lord revealed himself to him as a Lord, Savior, and God, then he immediately uh, became persecuted. <clears throat> and he generalizes uh, this uh, uh, and uh, prepares us for persecution. Uh, Paul says, you know, that everyone who wants to live godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. 2 Timothy 3.12 Everyone who wants to live according to the words of Jesus Christ will definitely, you know, face some adversity, many different forms of persecution. But that's what I believe is the essential part of a Christian life. How often, my dear brothers, we hear a different gospel that if you uh, become a believer, you should be healthy, wealthy, happy, and everything should be, uh, should have all right now. That's a different gospel. I don't read that gospel in, uh, in the Bible. And you know, I had the great privilege to meet many courageous believers. Not only those who have lost only their material things, their houses being looted, uh, burned or destroyed, their cars burned or destroyed, or people who lost completely everything because they were from Muslim background and when they abandoned the Muslim faith, they were just uh, expelled from their families and they lost all their inheritance. But the Lord also gave me a privilege to meet very courageous believers who have lost their beloved ones. Children, parents, brothers, sisters. But I can tell you the Lord gave me such a privilege to meet even those who have lost parts of their own bodies because they didn't want to renounce their faith in Jesus Christ. I'm sure you all have heard about uh, many Christians being killed in uh, you know, uh, predominantly in Muslim countries, but also in the radical Hindu countries or Buddhist countries. But sometimes in the Muslim countries, Christians uh, are being mutilated, their bodies are mutilated by the extremists. Why? Because they are just following the advice of their founder Muhammad that says, and it is written in the book of Hadith, that uh, in order to intimidate the Christian population that lives among them, they should literally cut off the left arm and right leg. And I can tell you I had this great privilege to meet the heroes of faith, which I would call them heroes of faith. When I was sitting, you know, opposite to them at the table and I was interviewing them, they were missing either both of one of these two parts of their bodies. And I can tell you that my personal faith was deeply encouraged through meeting them. I'm sure they went through the period of you know, being traumatized, having tears in their eyes, but when I met them, I could see that the joy of the Lord was their strength. You know, one time I was traveling to northern Nigeria uh, and uh, I met a very uh, pretty Nigerian lady. Her name is Monica. And uh, at that time she was 26 years old and her husband used to work as a policeman. And uh, when I said Maiduguri, you know, they were from Maiduguri, uh, this is the birthplace of uh, uh, Boko Haram. I'm sure you heard that. This is an um, uh, extremist uh, sect that uh, has been originally known for refusing Western education. Boko in Hausa means book, and Haram means forbidden. So basically the Western education was forbidden. But later on they became known for uh, rather uh, killing Christians, raping Christian women, and especially kidnapping the Christian girls, and selling them to be married in other Muslim countries. And one day, it was on Thursday, Monica and her husband were uh, riding on a motorbike to their Bible study group. They were committed believers in their church. Uh, in, even now, there are many churches in Maiduguri, despite the persecution. And they were stopped on the road by Boko Haram members. You know, they were dressed in semi-military way, you know, some uniforms, but they didn't have the boots. 
But because they were wearing machine guns and machetes, uh, Monica's husband decided to, to stop the motorbike, you know, and they were asked a very simple question. Are you Muslims or Christians? And both of them said straightforward, we are Christians. And they gave them literally the last chance to save their lives and become Muslims. I'm sure you know that, you know, to become a Christian, you know, it takes some time, right? You hear the gospel, you get the Bible, you read the Bible, you're being educated by going to church and then you're being prepared for the baptism and then you're baptized, right? It takes some time, but maybe you didn't know that to become a Muslim, you can become a Muslim within a few seconds. How? You just repeat the Muslim confession of faith, which is called Shahada. Basically, this is what you can hear five times per day from the mosque in any Muslim country. Neither Monica nor her husband were willing to accept this generous offer, you know, to save their lives. And they said firmly, we are Christians and we will remain Christians. But what followed is really difficult even to imagine. At first, they took Monica's husband aside and they literally in front of her, they decapitated him. She realized that she could not help her husband anymore, so she started to run away. But they were following her, you know, and chasing her, with, cutting with machete on her back. And later on, one of them was faster than Monica and grabbed her from behind, used his machete, and also cut her throat like this. Monica fell on the ground, started to bleed badly, lost her consciousness. And he, assuming that she was dead, he threw her body aside, you know, on the kind of ditch or sewer. <clears throat> you know, usually in the rainy season, these sewers are full of dirty water, but because it, it was in the dry season, it was just full of rubbish. Monica spent two and a half hours in this. And later on, when we interviewed her, she said that she saw beings dressed in shining white surrounding her and protecting her. After two and a half hours, she was eventually, you know, the police came, the real police, you know, and they started to remove the dead bodies of people who were killed on the day because they were not the only people who were attacked by Boko Haram on that day. And when they started to move Monica's body, you know, she started to move. And she could not speak because of the wound, but she used the sign language and she showed them that uh, she wanted to drink some water. But when she drank the water, the water went out through her throat. She was brought to the hospital where they saved her life by putting tracheostomy in her throat. <clears throat> and when I met her, at first, you know, anyone who didn't know her story could think that she was wearing a necklace because she was having the tracheostomy with, attached with a, just a simple rope around her neck. And I can tell you, Monica is a really pretty Nigerian lady, so no wonder that she would be wearing a necklace. And while my colleague who came, a medical, I would say the associate professor from Mayo Clinic from Rochester in the state of Minnesota in the United States, in one of the most prestigious health institutions of the world, who at that time served as our medical director, uh, was investigating, you know, and uh, you know, looking at the x-rays and taking out the metal tube from her throat. I was sitting there because I was supposed to do the interview, Monica. And I can tell you that that was the most difficult interview in my life. What would you ask the person who lost her husband in such a horrific way and herself was injured so badly? But later on, I dared to ask a very simple question. I asked Monica, how are you doing in the Lord? In other words, how has your relationship with the Lord Jesus changed after this experience? And I will never forget her answer. I will try to imitate her voice uh, so that, because Monica couldn't speak normally. Whenever Monica wanted to say something, she had to take a deep breath then close the hole in her tracheostomy so that the uh, air would come through her mouth, through the vocal cords, and then she could only whisper. So Monica, in order to answer my questions, she took a deep breath, closed the tracheostomy, and she screamed. I focus. 
Jesus. My eyes on eternity. And then again, she wanted to say a second sentence. Again, she took a deep breath, closed the tracheostomy, and she said, I uh, focus my eyes on Jesus. Monica told me that she considered herself and her husband to be a very committed believers. In fact, they got stopped when they were uh, riding on a motorbike to their Bible study. They were not just Sunday goers. They were taking part in the church life and everything what was going on there. But she confessed, you know, and no wonder because she was so pretty, you know, she confessed that she spent so much time, you know, every day, you know, walking through the market, uh, looking for, for hours, you know, to find a nice dress because she was so much concerned what she was wearing. And she was so kind of uh, motivated to find a nice dress for herself. And she said, my husband and I, we were both working hard because we wanted to buy a new car. And of course, he said, our dream was to build a bigger and better house. She said, I was distracted by so many, so many normal things that everyone does, right? But she said, from now on, I want to serve Jesus with 100% of my time, with all my energy, with all my finances, with everything what I have, I want to serve Jesus. And she has really been serving the Lord, even by helping uh, the Voice of the Martyrs to distribute other help uh, to, in our help to other widows who have lost their husbands in a very similar way. And her testimony has encouraged a lot of people around the world. So that the way how the Lord prepared me, and even about three weeks before I traveled to Sudan, and I'm coming now to my story, because I always prefer to tell other people's stories than mine, but I'm sure you're anxious to hear from me. And I visited uh, Monica about three weeks before I went to Sudan, where I eventually got arrested. I saw Monica, you know, she, her throat is healed now, you know, she, the tracheostomy removed, she can breathe normally, but still her voice is still marked. And I believe that the Lord will, wants to keep her like that. She's the living, a witness or a living martyr. Did you know, by the way, that the Greek word for the martyr, uh, for the martyr, martyros, is also being translated as a witness? If the Lord Jesus has called us to be his witnesses, it means exactly the same that we are called to be his martyrs. And I was encouraging other people uh, to uh, get ready for persecution in many countries. So how could I be surprised when persecution happened in my own life? I was overseeing a lot, a big part of the world. You know, I started with Central Asia, then Middle East, and uh, later Africa. You know, in the moment when I went to Khartoum, I was overseeing about maybe 250 different projects in 27 African countries where uh, Christians are persecuted. And I found only uh, four days in my busy travel schedule to verify some persecution cases that I heard about from Khartoum. I heard about one young Muslim background believer student who was son of Sheikh, you know, from Darfur. And he became a believer during his studies in, at the university. And he became a very joyful believer, and he immediately started to share his new faith with other fellow students. You know, to become a believer in a Muslim family, uh, those people are always considered like apostates, and they're like a big shame to their family. And because he was so active, you know, in evangelism at the university, even he became like in the viewfinder of the secret police. And together with the family, they decided to kill him. And they visited him one uh, day in his uh, temporary apartment. And after they have identified him, they threw a firebomb at him. And he got seriously burned on his face, chest, and hands. And he needed medical care. <clears throat> when I heard about him and saw the pictures, how he was injured, I decided I must visit him. 
and I brought even some financial help for his treatment. Uh, Voice of the Martyrs is helping many persecuted Christians, especially those who have been injured because of their uh, bold testimony. And I also saw pictures of churches that were completely demolished by the Sudanese authorities. And uh, you know, you can visit Khartoum and you can see uh, many churches, people going in and coming out, and you can easily get the false impression that there is a, a religious freedom, but there is not. In every church, they have secret informers from the secret police. And uh, you know, whenever the, the pastor uh, encourages uh, uh, his church members to uh, you know, follow Christ's great commission to make disciples of all people, including the Muslim majority, such pastor will be summoned to the police, a secret police headquarters, and they will friendly advise him not to do so. If he continues, he will soon end up in prison. And they can hold anyone in Sudan up to 12 months in prison without any court decision. The secret police can do whatever they want. want. And if he still continues after being released from prison, then his church will be just uh, demolished. They will find always the reason. Maybe they will find, uh, uh, bring some false documents and show that the ch part of the church is built on someone else's property. Or they will uh, say that you, your you know, fire uh, requirements are not being fulfilled in your church and they come with bulldozers and completely levy. And when I saw the pictures of churches being demolished right in the capital city of Khartoum, I said, I definitely have to come to visit. And I found, as I said, four days of my visit travel schedule just to visit Khartoum. You know, I have visited the country of Sudan many times before when it was still one country, when we were helping the persecuted Christians, especially in the south of the country. But when the southern Sudan got its independence in 2011, we focused on uh, northern Sudan, especially on the parts that have a large uh, Christian minorities like Nuba Mountains, for instance. And I've been there also in the Nuba Mountains where Christians were bombed on a daily basis at that time. But when I came to Khartoum, I only came to have several meetings with various pastors that I met before at a Sudanese conference in Ethiopia and had a very busy schedule. You know, some of the pastors I had to meet in a very noisy restaurant so that no one could record our conversation. I was able to visit this student, but only at night, you know, when it was uh, completely dark and also they told me that I should forget about taking photos of uh, uh, the young Muslim background believer student who was seriously burned uh, you know that was at night but the churches also it was uh, only at at night you know they told me if I was uh, uh, seen by the secret police taking photos of the uh, church sites that they will immediately arrest me so I visited also those places only during the night. And when I was having the feeling that all my, my mission got completed, at the end of four days, I uh, called my wife and I said, mission completed, I'm heading home. But I got arrested at the airport when I was literally holding in my hand the boarding passes from my flights home. I was arrested by secret police, they took my uh, cell phone, my camera, video camera, uh, laptop, all the memory cards that I had. And they started to show me as an evidence, you know, of my illegal activities, all the photos that they have taken of me during those four days. And when I saw that they had even photos that were taken with night vision camera, because they were uh, photos of those uh, visits at complete darkness, I realized that it is getting really serious. I missed my flights. I was not even able to talk uh, to my family to let them know that there is a problem. I was transferred to the secret police headquarters where I was interrogated for nearly 24 hours. After that, you know, they took me to the first prison. You know, I went uh, through the coming nearly 15 months through five different prisons in Sudan. And I can tell you that every move from one prison to another one always meant, you know, to like to go from bad to worse. <clears throat> and in 
And of course, you know, uh, after four months of uh, being interrogated by security police, I was just uh, brought uh, before the judge where I heard my official accusations. My activities of helping the uh, Muslim background believer student and uh, trying to document the persecution of the churches <coughs> was considered like espionage and even, uh, you know, the attempt to overthrow the regime in Sudan. And I was charged with uh, seven different articles and the first uh, two of them were the most uh, uh, important ones because there was a death penalty for them. And after four, day, four months of being interrogated by secret police, I, start, I was transferred to the next prison and I was being uh, you know, prosecuted by the prosecutors you know, who actually, uh, it also took four months. And after eight months being in prison, eventually our court case started. And at the end of this long six months trial, you know, when I heard my sentence, it was literally that I was sentenced to life imprisonment. In the video, you heard 20 years because in Sudan, you know, the life imprisonment doesn't mean that you have to die in prison. It's limited by 20 years. So that's good news. <laughs> And, you know, but the Lord intervened and uh, I was, uh, after this sentence, I was released within the next month. And my two Sudanese brothers were also released, uh, released three months later after me. But let's now look at what the great things the Lord has done uh, in, with, uh, for me and through me in the prison. Of course, the first uh, prison was the most difficult one because I was put, as you heard, into the same cell with uh, ISIS members, you know, those who were the enemies of the gospel and who treated me from the first day badly because they knew that I was a Christian. And they were uh, at first limiting my freedom of movement and using bad names, you know, calling me a filthy pig. And later on, uh, physical uh, beatings started and uh, they were always coming with new ways of torture, how they could uh, humiliate me and torture me and beat me. They were never satisfied because, you know, <clears throat> they were so proud of their Muslim faith. And you might be surprised, you know, that they were very young people. They were at the age of my own children, maybe ranging from 22 to 27 years. Uh, as you heard, you know, they were not only from uh, Sudan, they were from Libya, Somalia, Egypt, Yemen, uh, and other Muslim countries. And they were highly educated people. All of these ISIS members had university diplomas from various universities, not only in Africa, but also in Europe. And their own goal was to establish caliphate anywhere in the world where it would be possible. So they were also arrested because they either wanted to go to help the ISIS in Syria and Iraq, and they were, uh, someone reported them and they were arrested, or they were trying to overthrow the regime in Sudan. <coughs> And you heard about this Libyan guy, you know, who, who was always called by the other uh, Muslim uh, fellow prisoners. They called him a man of sword. And I thought at first that it was just because, you know, he was a personal guard of Osama bin Laden. He also showed them at one time, you know, the scars on his legs uh, from bullets when he was hit by uh, the U.S. soldiers when they were chasing Osama and they were so close to him. But later on, I realized that the true reason why he was called Man of Sword was because he was, you know, taking part in slaughtering these uh, Egyptian Coptic Christians on the Libyan shore. And, you know, these Muslims were so proud of their Muslim faith. <clears throat> they were telling me, you know, you Christians, you are, you are done. You know, Christianity is finished and the world, the fastest growing religion in the world is Islam. And I tried to disagree, you know, and then they said, you know, one of the guys was from UK and he said, you know, in UK, the churches are empty. No one wants to go to churches. And what they do with these churches, they sell them and we buy them. We make mosques of them. And he was right. You know, I was in UK many times and I saw, you know, these churches being turned into mosques. And they were also so proud about the Muslim faith that they said that even in the United States, there are pastors. They named me two pastors. I never heard about their names. I heard that this is actually happening. 
but never heard their names. They said that these pastors adopted Islam. And, uh, you know, they call it Chrislam. You know, Christianity plus Islam is Chrislam. It is being spread widely even in Europe. Especially in Germany, you can find even in the, among the high officials of the Lutheran church that they are saying, you know, that these, uh, you know, we should uh, adopt Islam as well. And so I felt like, you know, I needed somehow to defend, you know, the Christianity. You know, of course, I was not allowed to uh, speak, you know, at any time. Uh, I was only supposed to answer their questions. And that was the only way how I could share the gospel with them. And I did share the gospel, you know, I could uh, emphasize the difference uh, and I could tell them about the grace of God that he did through uh, the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. Sometimes they had arguments, sometimes they kept silent. You know, and when they were so proud, I felt like I needed to defend uh, the Christianity and I, uh, to my big surprise, they allowed me to share uh, Monica's testimony with them. Would you agree with me? That would be a great story, right? Yeah. To tell someone who is so proud and who uh, is, was killing, you know, uh, these people were killing Christians. So they allowed me to share. I was so excited. But I was not allowed to finish the story. Because in the moment I said that Monica's husband was decapitated in front of her, they interrupted me. They started to laugh in such a devilish way that I would never be willing to or able to imitate. And they were shouting Allahu Akbar and rejoicing that another infidel got killed. I have realized that I was amidst of the spiritual warfare. You know, and I was uh, really struggling in the first uh, uh, three and a half months. I have lost 25 kilos of my body weight because of the uh, malnutrition, you know, uh, after one month in prison, I started a hunger strike, so they took me to the hospital. Uh, they discovered that I was also heavily anemic. You know, they forced me to receive the infusion of glucose so that I would not die. But they have tested my blood and they realized that literally I have lost half of my blood. And in this situation, you know, when I was not only emotionally down, but also physically down, I can tell you that I have experienced what the Paul says in 2 Corinthians 12, 10. When I am weak, then I am strong. And the Lord allowed me, you know, to be, to continue to be the witness for Christ. You know, uh, they got really uh, irritated by the fact that I never retaliated. Actually, it made them even worse and worse, uh, you know, and trying to find new ways of torture. But the Lord gave me such a grace that... I was not, all, not only able to share the gospel with my words through my answers, but also to live the gospel according to Christ's words. I can tell you this was not out of my strengths. People who know me from school, especially from the school years, I was always the fighter. I always wanted to win any battle and never let the people do the last you know, hit on me. But in this situation, the Lord gave me such a grace that I was literally able to turn my other cheek to them when they hit me on the first one. And, you know, and they were just uh, uh, coming with new ways, you know, of, uh, you know, <clears throat> of beatings and humiliation. You know, one day they also told me that I was not only supposed to wash their underwear in the small bucket, but also to clean the toilet with my bare hands. That's the way how they tried to humiliate me. But I was in the situation when I was heavily anemic. You know, when you're anemic, you know, your body uh, does not have enough hemoglobin, which is carrying oxygen in your body. And uh, if you do not have enough oxygen in your body, especially your brain does not have o enough oxygen, it means that you cannot remember things that you have memorized uh, when, uh, you know, early. I was not uh, able to remember the Psalm 23 that my parents taught me even when I was four year, old, four year old, before I was even able to read and write. I could not remember Christian songs that I memorized when I was younger. Why? Because my brain was not working properly because of the anemia. But the Lord, you know, I was kind of worried about that I may, you know, the, the fact that I would die, that was not on my first, uh, uh, you know, concern. My first concern was that I may lose my sound mind. Not only that I was 
uh, malnutrition, I was heavily anemic, but not only that I was witnessing the five times per day prayers of these uh, six other people, we were seven people in the cell that normally was designed for just one person, so we were squeezed there. But they were also, you know, I did not, I was not allowed to have Bible, but they had three, four printouts of Quran, and they were reading Qurans the whole day. And that all, you know, this pressure, the beatings and torture, that uh, created, uh, you know, kind of situation for me that I started to cry out to the Lord and literally asking him that he will keep my mind sound. And when I was so concerned, the Holy Spirit started to remind me portions of Bible verses. Like Philippians 4, 7, you know, that Paul says, Paul is talking about the uh, heavenly peace. And he says, this heavenly peace is surpassing all human understanding. And Paul says that this peace will guard your minds and hearts in Christ Jesus. And I was so much concerned, you know, <clears throat> that I, I needed to occupy my mind with something that would make sense, right? And the Lord reminded me the passage from Revelation 4, when we read about the four creatures or beings that are in front of the throne of God. And the scripture says, what they are doing day and night, they exalt the name of the Lord. And they say what? Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty who was, who is, and who is to come. And so I said to myself, if they can do it day and night for eternity, why couldn't I try to do it for one hour? Maybe one day, one week, or a month? I was even afraid to think further on for future, because I hope that I will be released soon. So I started to exalt the name of the Lord this way. And I mo modified, you know, this verse by exalting the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, you know, and giving the Lord the names that I have, uh, you know, learned from Hebrew, uh, from the Old Testament. And I can tell you that the situation in our cell has dramatically changed. I started to, uh, you know, experience a deep peace in my mind. I was even able to pray for my uh, people, for my fellow prisoners who were beating and torturing me. If you read about uh, Stephen, that he was praying for those who were stoning, I can tell you it is possible. It is possible through Christ who is with us. You know, I had a good reason to pray for them because, you know, on my previous trips, for instance, in Egypt, once I met uh, the uh, former Muslim Brotherhood members. Muslim Brotherhood is another Muslim extremist sect in Egypt. And I met those two people who were originally taking part in killing other Christians and raping Christian women. But the Lord Jesus revealed himself to them as the Lord, Savior, and God, like he did to Saul. And hey, they also became Pauls and immediately started to be persecuted. So I had good reason to believe that the Lord could reveal himself to those ISIS members who were with me in the cell. You know, and one day, uh, this last week when the situation, you know, when I continue to experience a deep peace uh, in my mind, when I accidentally look into their eyes, I have realized that they became more and more furious. And it was like looking into the eyes of devil. I realized that I was a midst of the spiritual warfare. And they came uh, with the idea that they will torture me with waterboarding. Waterboarding is a way of torture. They lay, lay you down on your back, cover the mouth uh, with uh, the cloth, and they start pouring water on your mouth from a bucket uh, that will give you the feelings that you are getting drowned in water. Uh, and they were already getting ready for that. You know, they showed me the piece of cloth and they uh, uh, told the guards because the guards were listening to their orders. The guards were actually afraid of the ISIS guys and they were allowing them to walk from cell to cell to reorganize themselves, to recruit new sympathizers. So they moved our cell to the only place in the, pri in the prison where there was a running water every day. Now we normally were carrying the buckets. And the night before, they also decided uh, to in interrogate me. You know, they knew about my fellow brothers, the pastors that they've been arrested week after me. I had no idea for the whole months that anyone else was arrested. They knew it immediately the next day when they were br brought uh, to prison because they were in touch with the guards. 
And you know, they were asking questions about the work and I, uh, you know, didn't want to tell them anything and uh, they never liked my answer. So whenever they didn't like my answer, I, they used the broomstick, you know, and they, I was hit. I was being beaten. I've been beaten many times and I felt a lot of pain. Sometimes, you know, one time they hit my elbow with the swing heavy wooden door at the toilet corner and I had pain still the rest of my imprisonment until I came home when they x-rayed it, but it was not broken. But at this time, when I'm on my knees in front of them and I'm being beaten, I experienced such a deep peace and I could pray for them. And the Lord showed me in a short, I would say one third of the second vision of the wall uh, of the uh, prison cell, I saw the Lord Jesus, you know, when he was arrested by Jewish authorities, that he was spitted on, he was ridiculed, and the scripture says that he was beaten with a wooden stick. You know, you can imagine, you know, that when I got arrested, you know, even though any trip that I made before, I always left a copy of my uh, hotel reservation, my airline ticket uh, with my wife. But on that uh, day, I did not return. So the first person that my wife called that night when I did not return, and they had no idea what happened to me, was our pastor. And immediately he uh, initiated the praying chain and people started to pray. And three weeks later, the pastor initiated also the fasting chain, time unlimited fasting chain. And our church is probably the same size like yours. And uh, I remember the pastor later told me that he was skeptical whether our small church would be uh, you know, able to not to discontinue this fasting chain uh, until I'm released. And he came home and he realized that those young people who had internet connection and smartphones, you know, they were not supposed to look at them during the sermon, but they already signed up for the first two weeks when he came home. And my wife continued to go to the uh, church and uh, normally we would go once per week uh, uh, to Bible study. But she was invited twice, sometimes three, three times per week to the Bible study group. And one uh, the Bible study, you know, the elder who was leading this Bible study <clears throat> had his Bible in his hands, closed his Bible, and he said, I feel like the Holy Spirit now is leading to stop discussing this passage, but just to get on our knees and to pray for Peter and for the situation that he finds himself right now in his cell in. So they closed their Bibles, literally went on their knees and started to proclaim the Lord's victory in the cell where I was. You know, in our family, um, you know, from the very beginning, and this was the same what I was doing in our, with my parents, we are using the uh, Moravian church uh, watchwords that started nearly 300 years ago. You know, there's a Bible reading for evening, for, for morning, for evening, and the Bible verses, two Bible verses for each day. And we use this book also to record our important events in our family. You know, every... New Year's Eve, you know, when people are celebrating, you know, and drinking and doing, we sit down and we open this book and we just are thankful to the Lord what he has done that year from January 1st to December 31st. And so when I returned from prison, I also wanted to know what my wife was experiencing on each day, you know, and we found out that exactly that night, the night before the waterboarding was supposed to start, when I was badly beaten, and I, to my great surprise, I did not feel the pain on that night that much. I was aware that they were hitting me, but somehow I was not feeling the pain that much. But we realized that that was exactly the same night when they started to exalt the victory and proclaim the victory of the Lord in the cell where I was. Isn't that amazing? You know, we say, we see from Romans 8:27 that the Spirit is interceding for us. Yeah. And it says, the scripture says that uh, he is praying according to the will of God. And then the Lord made a miracle on the next morning. When they were about to start the waterboarding, you know, there was one guard who was hated by the ISIS members because he never allowed them to go from cell to cell. And he was on duty that morning. And he heard something, you know, he was known for secretly listening, you know, to the conversation and reporting it to the interrogators. And he was hated for that. 
But on that morning, he heard something was going wrong and something was supposed to happen to me. Immediately, he opened the door of the cell. He commanded me to take all my stuff and leave the cell. I had the, that was the first liberation, you know. I had the feeling like, you know, that Daniel must have had when he was released from the lion's den. But when I was looking and walking amidst of them, and looking into their eyes, you know, it was exactly like looking into the eyes of the devil. But, you know, I was, I was then uh, put in a solitary confinement, you know, and solitary confinement is a punishment in each prison, yeah. right? And uh, uh, not only just ordinary solitary confinement, but they were blowing the cold air on me the whole night. And they deliberately took my blanket off me so that I could not warm myself up. You know, and I was, uh, this was for me the first moment of freedom. Can you imagine after two months of not being able to pray out loud, not being able to sing out loud, uh, not able to speak out loud, suddenly I was free, you know. And I heard from the ISIS guys that, you know, everyone was afraid of the solitary confinement. Why? Because, you know, they have experienced the solitary confinement, you know. And they have just uh, told me even in the beginning that uh, if you are there more than one week, you will lose your mind. But I have experienced the Lord's presence in the real physical way. And the Lord, you know, uh, showed me that he was there. You know, he warmed up in one moment my body in the supernatural way that I could, even though I could not sleep the whole night, but I could just pray out loud. And I started in the face, you know, to sing the wonderful song of the hymn, actually, uh, I'm sure you know it, Thine Be the Glory, you know, the uh, uh, melody written by uh, Handel. And I have memorized this song when I was maybe 15, 16 years old. But when I tried previously to sing this song, I was not able to remember more than four words from this song. But suddenly, in this solitary confinement, when the cold air was blowing on me the whole night, I started to sing it in face, and it was like a moment when the poet has a moment of inspiration and writes and writes and writes, and within a few moments the beautiful poem is written. I did not have a uh, pen or paper at the time, but the Lord gave me miraculously back the first two verses of this wonderful hymn. And about three or four days later I received the third verse of this. So I started to sing, I was loud, and I'm sure that the guards and the uh, ISIS members, they were sure that I got mad after the first night already. But it was a, a tremendous freedom for me to move around. You know, I was walking from dawn to dusk. I was praying, you know, the, from dawn to dusk. I have even calculated that I may have made like maybe 20 kilometers per day walking and praying all the time. But I can confess, you know, that my only concern was to go home. And when eventually after these four months, they took me downstairs, returned my carry-on luggage. I could put first the best clothes that I had in my storage room. For the first time after four months, you know, I had, uh, uh, I was able to use deodorant, you know. And they took me this time without chains. And we were going the direction to the airport, but we were just going to the different prison where the conditions were much worse because we were, I lost the comfort of the solitary confinement. I was put into the cell where it was just a small room, maybe 25 square meters, where we were sometimes more than 40 people squeezed in. And there was no toilet corner. We were only allowed twice a day to go to the toilet. We were treated literally like dogs. You know, one time in the morning, one time in the evening. And twice a day, they brought a bowl of hard skin boiled beans, you know, very tasteless, absolutely no taste, and some moldy breads that we had to even fight for so that we could fill our empty stomachs. And one time when we were around 30 people there, you know, they just brought another 12 prisoners. And they were young youngsters, teenagers, Eritrean refugees who were caught on the Sudanese-Libyan border. And because they didn't have money to pay the fine for illegal crossing, they were put to prison. And that was a moment in this, 
absolutely were probably 43, 44 people maybe at the time. Suddenly, you know, I felt led by the Holy Spirit, you know, to uh, like telling me, go sit beside them and share the gospel with them. And so I, I couldn't, uh, you know, withstand this calling. And I went, you know, through the crowd and uh, I addressed them and I, they were gladly listening to me. You know, there were two of them who spoke very good English and they were serving as interpreters to the rest. And they were gladly listening to me. Why? Because, you know, they saw me as a potential future help when they were sure that sooner or later they will make it across the border and I will be released. Uh, so they may need my help in Europe. So they were listening to me, right? So I shared first my testimony. Then I shared also the gospel with them explain the gospel to them and encourage them to pray with me too. And they asked them whether they were willing to dedicate and commit their lives to Christ. And they all did. All 12 of them that night were praying with me and we could not sleep the rest of the night, but we were just rejoicing and telling, you know, explaining. I was explaining more about the gospel to them. And the next morning they all were called from our cell and they were brought uh, transferred to a different prison and I did not see them anymore. But my spiritual eyes were open. I uh, said to the Lord, I said, Lord, now I know why I had to be in prison four months and one day. Because these people needed to hear the gospel. And I started to consider what is four months, what is one year, what is 15 years compared to the eternity if someone who hears the gospel will spend it in heaven. And I started to be absolutely bold and I started to share the gospel with anyone who would listen to me and who was willing to listen to me. With these, all the other Muslims who were in the same cell with me. And uh, you know, the prison guards didn't like it, of course, you know, because I was openly doing activity that many pastors were many, several times already in prison. All the people that were the Christians that were arrested with me after my uh, arrest, you know, a week later, all of them spent uh, maybe once or twice already time in prison. They were used to it. Sometimes, you know, the interpreter who was uh, uh, during his previous arrest, he was even tortured with electric current. You know, and they didn't like it. So I was again to put in this another solitary confinement in this prison. And I have to say that I welcome that because I knew what it was to be in solitary confinement. I have space, uh, you know, I didn't have to fight for food. They brought the food suddenly in a smaller bowl. Same tasty beans and same moldy bread. Same way of going to the toilet only twice a day. But I was so rejoicing that I had, could breathe more and I have more space for myself. But my joy became even greater about a week later because I had a visitor from the Czech embassy in Cairo and uh, the consulate officer uh, brought me this Bible. After five months of not having the Bible, eventually I had Bible in my hands. It was so precious, you know, I was so hungry, so thirsty after the word of God. But, you know, I could not read the whole day. There was uh, not enough light, so I could only read from 8 a.m. till 5 p.m. And I had literally to stand at the window, approximately in this height, and read like this. And uh, you might not see it from afar, but this edge of the Bible is scratched because I was leaning in on the bars on the window. And I was so thirsty and hungry that I read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation within three weeks in this standing position. And I was so glad, I was so nourished, my spirit uh, was so nourished through the reading and I kept reading it all over again. You know, my reading plan was like when I was reading New Testament, Monday, Gospel of Matthew, Tuesday, Mark, Wednesday, Luke, Thursday, John, and so on and so forth. You know, within the nine months that I had the Bible, I read the Old Testament six times and New Testament ten times, and every day I was reading uh, my initial reading was always the book of Psalms, my most favorite passage in the Bible. And the, the Lord spoke to me in such a marvelous way. You know, I was not allowed at first to have any paper or pen. But uh, I, after four months, I started to receive letters from my family. So at least I used the other page, the empty uh, blank page on the letter. And I managed somehow to get uh, the pen from my luggage when I was going to pick up some medicines. And I started to write these wonderful discoveries from the scripture. You know, passages that I thought that I understood, 
I started to understand in a new way. It was a private Bible study with the Holy Spirit. And the passages that I never understood, for instance, like the parable about unjust manager, you know, I was always struggling, or the book of Revelation, you know, whenever I had my reading plans before, and I reached the book of Revelation, I kept reading even faster so that I would finish it soon and I would, could start reading from the scratch again. But I started to record these devotions to these papers. And I was wondering, you know, sometimes I barely managed to write it down how fast the thoughts and the connection between the Bible verses used to come. And I was always wondering, Lord, why do I have this privilege? I was in solitary confinement. I didn't have anything else to do during the day like just reading the Bible and praying. But the answer came three months later. When we were eight months in prison and our court case initially started, we had to be transferred to a different prison. And they put us about two hours drive from Khartoum into a desert where there is a huge prison called Al Huda that has capacity something like 10,000 prisoners. Real criminals, murderers, rapers, drug dealers, uh, thieves, child abusers, real criminals fighting on these cells, huge cells. You know, I was put, I lost the comfort from the solitary confinement because I was put to the cell with 100 other prisoners. And I could not read my Bible because it was too dark in these cells. The windows were too high, I could not read. But this was also the first prison when even the Muslim prisoners were for the first time allowed to do their ablutions and go to the mosques. In fact, every section of like four cells, so roughly 400 prisoners, they must have always their own mosque. So many mosques were in this prison, but they were also non-Muslim prisoners. So the prison authorities, for the non-Muslim prisoners, they have changed one of these uh, normal cells. They took out the triple beds. There was like 25 triple beds, so 75 beds, but 100 prisoners. So permanently, uh, 25 people were sleeping on the floor. And you, should, you could normally wait maybe one and a half year, two years after your turn would come and you would get the bed. But on the, you know, out of these one of these cells, the prison authorities made a prison chapel. And on the first day, some brothers came and they heard that there was one European and two Sudanese pastors who came to this prison. They came to invite us to this prison chapel. At first, they started to drums, use drums. Maybe 20, 25 people showed up. And it was exactly like in the book of Acts. They asked us to come forward. And they said, brothers, if you have any words of encouragement, please tell us. And my two Sudanese uh, fellow prisoners, the pastors, they knew that I had the Bible for three months. So they said, you had the Bible, you preach first. And I remember that I preached from John 15, the first uh, 10 verses, when the Lord Jesus is telling his disciples, I am the true vine and you are the branches. And my father is the vine dresser. Every branch that bears the fruit he pruned so that it could bear better fruit. So I did a little sermon and I told them that our main point as Christians is really to bear the fruit. And we all know about the fruit of the Holy Spirit, peace, joy, and love, and so on. But absolutely the, the, the main point for us as Christians, the main fruit for us is to multiply ourselves, to make disciples. And I told them that the Lord, Lord wants us to really uh, bring a very good uh, fruit, and that's why he is pruning our lives. Yeah. But I also told them that sometimes it really hurts when the Lord is pruning our lives. And I shared Monica's testimony also with them, and they were deeply encouraged. Many of them had tears in their eyes, and they could not believe the reaction of the ISIS guys in my first prison. I can tell you that, you know, we are, I was able to preach at least once a week, sometimes twice a week, because when three more preachers came, they increased their number of services from twice a week to five times per week. There was only Saturdays and Mondays when there was no service. And we could preach to these absolutely hopeless, desperate and forgotten people. And they could find the reconciliation with God through the blood of Jesus Christ. I can tell you without any exaggeration that these six months that I had there in Al Huda, 
were not only the best six months of my prison life, but they were the best six months of my life. Because I have never seen so many people coming to Christ through my ministry. And it was not like a crusade uh, preacher, you know, who goes from one place to another place. We were staying with these people. We were observing the uh, changes in their lives. We were explaining the things. It was such a wonderful ministry that we really stopped being concerned how long time we will stay in prison. Because we knew that the Lord was in control and the Lord was holding the keys of ourselves. And you know, I would like to encourage you, you know, to pray for our dear persecuted brothers and sisters. And especially uh, pray for those who are in prison. You know, when I was in prison <clears throat> and I was feeling sorry for myself, the Lord showed me like a picture on the wall, three Eritrean pastors whom I met uh, when I was visiting Eritrea, you know, about 12 years before my time in prison. And they were in prison already 12 years. They are still now in prison more than 14 years or 15 years, one of them. So I stopped praying for them. But when you will pray, we have a kind of, a kind of nice uh, in, uh, instruction, you know, how we should pray. Paul gave, gave us this wonderful, if you open Ephesians 6 uh, from uh, verses, uh, uh, from the verse 18, uh, 18 through 21, <clears throat> we hear this, that Paul is actually writing from prison and he is encouraging uh, the Christians in Ephesus that they should be praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints and also for me that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. I can tell you that we were not only able to read this passage in prison, we were able to live this passage in prison. We too were ambassadors in chains. Anytime they were transform, tra transporting us, uh, they always put heavy chains on our hands or sometimes they tied us together. But as Apostle Paul says in 2 Timothy uh, chapter 2 from 8 to 10, he says, even though I am bound as a criminal. The word of God is not bound. So pray that the Lord will give to these brothers and sisters who are in prison the right words to share the good news, to bear the witness wherever they are. But also, please pray for those, their family members, that the Lord would give them the supernatural heavenly peace that is surpassing all human understanding. But when you will be praying for our persecuted brothers and sisters, I'm sure that the Lord will show what else you could do for them. And you can hear more, you know, from uh, Brother Ashley, from the Voice of the Martyrs in South Africa. Yeah. And when you will be praying, I'm sure the Lord will show what else you can do to help our brothers and sisters who are being persecuted. But I have one extra uh, plea for you, please. Pray, join me also in prayers for the six ISIS members who were with me in the cell. We know that the Lord can reveal himself to them as the Lord, Savior, and God. And uh, we know that uh, you know, Christianity is the only religion that is teaching its followers to love uh, our enemies. And I would like to read you what the Lord Jesus said in uh, Luke 6, 27 and 28. The Lord said, but I say to you who hear, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. <clears throat> Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. So we have, uh, uh, we have this instruction right from the word of God. We should never be afraid of persecution. We know that the persecution is actually the privilege. When you open Philippians 1.29, you will read what Paul was writing to the Philippians. He said, it has been granted to you as a privilege, not only to believe in God, but also to suffer for his name. Yeah. And we should always remember what uh, uh, John writes in 1 John 5.4, when he says that for everyone who has been born of God 
overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord uh, give you uh, the readiness, you know, to uh, be prepared to do for the Lord and follow him no matter what will happen in our lives. We all are members of the same body. We know that if one part of the body suffers, the whole body feels the pain. And I'm sure I've noticed that some of you had tears in your eyes when I was sharing Monica's story. That's a good sign, actually. You should not be ashamed for your tears. This is actually the proof that you belong to the same body because it hurt, it hurt you. But can you see the, what the Lord has done amazing? You know, when you look at my four days trip planned, but the Lord has made it to 445 days of a wonderful deepening my prayer life through the first five months, having a wonderful Bible study with the Holy Spirit for three months so that I could preach for six months and a fruitful ministry. What can we say? We can just agree with the words from Isaiah 55 that he says from the verse 8 through 10, my thoughts are not like human, your human thoughts. My ways are not like your human ways. As the heavens is higher than the earth, so much higher are my thoughts with you. And the word of God will not return empty, but it will just bring the fruit for it was sent. May the Lord bless you and thank you for your attention. Yeah.